Welcome to the course Optimization Methods for Machine Learning and Engineering. Today's lecture will be on duality. The agenda for today is as follows. First of all, we will talk about Lagrangian duality, one particular kind of duality interesting for optimization. We will then see the karush kuhn taka conditions, which uh, are conditions that need to hold for optimal solutions. And uh, we will see the primal dual methods, which give us a nice speed up in the optimization of convex optimization problems. Okay, first of all, duality. Why are we interested in the subject? Duality is oftentimes um, used to describe an object that has two alternative representations. And I can transform between the two representations without losing any critical information. And uh, we see an example here. For example, uh, here we have a, a set as the union of points. So here I have a set and um, I have many points in the set. And I just describe the set as the union and there can be also infinitely many uh, points in my union. So here it looks as if I had a set that is uh, compact, um, that means it is closed and bounded. So if I take two points from the set, they have, they always have a finite distance. And um, so it's closed it, and uh, it includes the, the closure. And also it looks like a, a convex set. And for these types of sets, I can also describe them as the intersection of um, some half spaces. So here down below we see the half spaces. So the half spaces are active, are excluding um, one part of the original space um, R2. So R2 is the original space and now we have all these half spaces and each of them is excluding like a half of R2 quote unquote. And in the intersection exactly our set remains but uh, depending on how this exactly is uh, defined, we might need infinitely many of these half spaces. But I can translate between these two points of view, um, sets of unions or intersection of half, of half spaces. And depending on what I want to do, one or the other might be more, more practical. There are other examples, for example, the Fourier transform of a time series, uh, where I can also transform between the time series and the Fourier uh, transform uh, up to the, the, the frequency that can still be represented. Okay, and uh, why do we care? Why is this interesting in optimization? Um, so when we compute the dual of an optimization problem, uh, what we get is a lower bound. So this tells us how good we can get in with a solution. Uh, so the lower bound uh, must not be achieved in every case but uh, I know that I cannot get better than a certain quality of the, of the solution. And uh, I might use that to, for early stopping to say, when can I stop my, my solution? For example, when I'm closer to 0.01% of, the, uh, of, the, of uh, the unit that I'm, that I'm optimizing over. Okay, and then uh, we will uh, see additional improvements that we get, for example, dimensional re reduction by looking at additional structure that is exposed by the dual and also faster convergence by considering additional optimality conditions. Okay. Now let's take a closer look at Lagrangian duality. This is only one type of duality, even on optimization. Uh, therefore, this can get confusing. We need to be precise which duality we are talking about. Here it's the Lagrangian duality, and uh, this is often presented uh, by just stating facts about the, the dual representation. Uh, here we will take an approach in order to really understand, and uh, the material will be developed from the point of view of game theory. So this is not found as often as I would uh, prefer. Um, so, but uh, here it will uh, enable us uh, some, some, some insights that we wouldn't get otherwise. Okay, game theory. Let's jump directly into the subject. Uh, game theory is the brainchild of John von Neumann and we have mentioned him already several times. 
Yeah, so John von Neumann is extremely interesting and uh, he, for example, he wrote the book that first used Hilbert spaces to describe quantum mechanics. It's the same John von Neumann that developed the von Neumann computer architecture that is really prevalent today. He was uh, important in the development of the atomic bomb during the Second World War and he also originated game theory. He wrote uh, an article in 1928, so Theorie der Gesellschaftsspiele, and then later in 1944 he published a book um, on the theory of games together with Oskar Morgenstern, and this is really the, the groundwork for, for much of what uh, happened uh, in the early development of, of game theory. And uh, John von Neumann said about the Minimax theorem that we are looking at today, he said about that the theorem, as far as I can see, there could be no theory of games without that theorem. I thought there was nothing worth publishing until the Minimax theorem was proved. Yeah, okay, so really uh, a strong advocate of, of this theorem and we will see that uh, the results are, are deep and, and important also for optimization. Okay, let's start off with the first equation and here we see the Minimax equality which says that for a, a function psi from x and y to the real numbers, we have that the supremum of the infimum of the function is smaller than the infimum of the supremum of the function. Okay, now we have to unpack that a little bit. What does that mean? First of all, the supremum and infimum, these are the equivalents of the max and min operator. Uh, so we have the max operator is somehow similar to the supremum operator and the min operator is somehow similar to the infimum operator. But uh, there is a very important difference and uh, the difference is that the infimum and the supremum they include the limit um, for which the solution tends. Let me give an example. If we are looking for the infimum in an open set and we have some function defined on an open set and there is like some some search direction we want to go in that direction and um, then we will get to the uh, to the closure of our open set and the infimum operator it will actually return to us the limit so the point on the closure to which the minimization tends or converges and uh, the, the min operator will not do that. So the min operator can only return solutions from the set and the infimum operator can also return a solution on the closure if it's an open set. And uh, this might also be important if uh, we are just in, in Rn, so the, which is an open set, um, because there the infimum operator it might return to us infinity and the min operator in, in principle will not do that. Okay, so now uh, we will talk about the supremum and the infimum when we are in the context of, of an open set or in the context of not a closed set. So there are also sets that are neither open nor closed. Okay, and uh, what happens here is essentially I am creating uh, an, uh, two optimizations that are nested. So I have a first optimization here, the infimum on the left hand side, and I can look at this as a, a function q of uh, y, q of y, and um, this q function internally performs the optimization uh, of finding the infimum given a particular y. Yeah, and then the outer problem is the supremum, so max maximizing, and uh, what I'm saying here is that if I'm uh, f if I take the supremum of the function that internally minimizes um, um, for x, um, then uh, the result will be smaller than if I call the function that inter with x that internally uh, now let's call this w w of x then the function that internally does the uh, maximization 
and uh, so this inequality it always holds. So independently of whether uh, psi is, is convex or not, independently of whether x and y are nicely shaped or not, uh, this minimax inequality we always have that. Uh, but um, we can now get a step further. Uh, so for Neumann he discovered then that if x and y are compact, so closed and bounded, and if they are uh, and uh, also convex, and if in addition this psi is convex in x and concave in y, then I have equality here. That means that independently of whether I first do the maximization and then the minimization or the other way around, I will get to the exact same result. And here now I can talk about max and min instead of infimum and supremum because uh, we are now in, a, in closed sets uh, and therefore this is possible. And uh, this situation here, we can think about this as a two-player zero-sum game. So here I have two players, x and y, who play one player against the other. And uh, every, uh, every, every win of player x is the loss of player y. This is why this is called a zero-sum game. So uh, it's like a, a game where there are finite resources and everything player x has, player y does not have. So zero-sum game. And therefore the player x he tries to, so this function, uh, essentially we can say that Psi is now uh, counting all the winnings of player X. So the player X, he wants to maximize that. And um, no, it's the other way around. So the player uh, Y wants to maximize that and the player X wants to minimize it. And uh, here it also says that um, it is not important in which order these players can 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 play. Um, so um, you can think about the minimax inequality up here uh, a little bit like a game situation where in the first um, where on the where on the left hand side the player y can choose first and on the right hand side the player x can choose first. Um, okay. And um, it says that um, if the player y uh, can choose first, then he will be at a disadvantage because the player x, he can see what the player y did and he can already counteract. So he then has knowledge about y will do and choose accordingly. And if I switch that the other way around, then the player y will be at an advantage. Yeah, so it depends on, on uh, yes, um, it might be a little bit different if we are considering um, situations where the uh, choices that X made um, 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 impact the remaining choices of Y. Yeah? So, so if the set Y depends on the choice of the other player, then we not necessarily have this minimax equality, but in the setting as it is described here, the minimax inequality always holds. Okay, and in the minimax theorem, if we are in a situation where it's compact um, and convex, the two the two uh, selection sets, and the function is convex in x and concave in y, then we always have equality. And uh, let's see how how far we can get with with just that uh, initial result. Okay, now game theory in a nutshell. Let's uh, see a couple of examples here. Here we have two games. Uh, the first uh, you might have all played when you were children. So the first game is called Rock, Paper, Scissors. I have two players playing against one another and uh, depending on whether they choose Rock, Paper and Scissors and what the other one does, um, the first player is either winning and then he gets a one or he is losing, then he gets a minus one. For example, if the first player chooses rock and the second player chooses scissors, then the first player wins, he gets a one. And if the first player chooses rock and the other player chooses paper, then the first player loses, minus one. This is a zero-sum game because every gain of the first player is the loss of the second player. 
The second example that we look at is the prisoner's dilemma, and this is not a zero-sum game, but it has other very interesting properties. Now, imagine that uh, two robbers um, broke into a bank together and were caught, um, or some time after, the police um, caught them, um, but the police doesn't have uh, really good evidence. So they try to convince the robbers of signing a, um, uh, signing a, um, a letter where they state they, or where they confess that um, they, 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 they were the robbers of the bank. And uh, in order to entice the robbers to sign the confessment, uh, they are confessing, um, the police wants to uh, give them a deal. And uh, so, first of all, if both of the robbers don't talk, um, then they will be uh, then they will get some sentence. But there is the doubt, and therefore they get both, uh, for example, two years in prison. And this is minus two for both of them. If both of them don't confess. Uh, on the other hand, if one of them takes the deal then the police offers him to let him go, so he has a cost of zero. Um, but uh, when the, only when the other one is not talking. So when one of them is talking and for example is saying, well, the, the other one was the main instigator of the whole robbery and I was only, uh, and I was maybe forced to partake in that and so on, then he can go freely and the other one will get 10 years. However, if both of the robbers confess then both of them will get five years in prison. And now the big question is what should they do? Uh, so should they talk or shouldn't they talk? Obviously in this case they must not coordinate. Um, um, but uh, everybody so on his own has to think about his situation, what should he do? And then he confesses to the police or not. And um, we can think about the selection or the actions that everybody is taking. We can think about that as a discrete selection. So either I talk or I don't talk, or either I choose rock or I choose paper and so on. Uh, but uh, we, can, uh, we can think about that also differently. So uh, we can have the pure actions, which are the, 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 the choices that can be taken, uh, but we can also devise so-called mixed strategies. And the mixed strategies, these are simply probability distributions over the pure strategies. So in rock, paper, scissors, I can, um, I can think about a strategy that I will take rock in 20% of the cases and paper in 80% of the cases and I will never take scissors. So this would be a valid um, mixed strategy. Or here we have another example. So 10% of rock and 50% of paper and so on. And uh, the same for the prisoner's dilemma. So probably no, no robber will ever do that, but in principle they could also think about their choices in terms of, of mixed strategies. And um, for the rock, paper, scissors example, the question is, if you were the player, how would you react to this mixed strategy that we saw here? And if I know that most of the time the other player will choose paper, then I will counteract accordingly. So if the other guy probably or with probability larger than, than a third will choose paper, then the best reaction of Y is to always select the scissors. Um, and uh, the question is what is the best strategy for the prisoners? And also is there maybe a stable situation where both are happy with their situation and um, I can or the other one can guess what the other what the other uh, prisoner or the other robber will, will do and uh, the problem up here is with the prisoner's dilemma is that there is no no real equilibrium so for the rock paper scissors games there is an equilibrium because if I if one of the players chooses every option in 33% or in a third of all cases, then the best reaction of the other one is also to, to play randomly with a third all the time. Um, but for the prisoner's dilemma, there is no such equilibrium because initially, if we say initially both don't want to talk, huh? 
and then one of the prisoners can improve his situation um, but uh, that means or when this happens then the other prisoner can furthermore improve his situation and uh, what in, uh, in the end both will talk or actually have to take it back so if both talk this is actually a stable situation because there is no incentive of both of the prisoners to not talk when the other one does um, but this is not a very good equilibrium because uh, there would be a better outcome for both of them but the better outcome where both don't talk this one is not stable okay and finding these strategies in general it can be computationally challenging so there are books on algorithmic game theory how to find these equilibria and uh, generally humans are not capable because it's just also mentally uh, algorithmically too complicated and uh, there are also situations where there is more than one equilibrium and these equilibrium type of situations have been studied very famously by, by John Nash and uh, here is now the definition so such a Nash equilibrium is a stable combination of player strategies when none of the players can improve his situation by changing his strategy unilaterally and uh, Nash, he showed that in, uh, in certain categories of games, so also the, the non-zero sum games, at least one Nash equilibrium must exist. And um, so in all the games where the mixed strategies, where the set of mixed strategies is compact, then the set or, of strategies must, uh, must contain one Nash equilibrium. And uh, now what is a compact set here for the for the mixed strategies for the rock paper scissors game uh, what we see here this is called uh, the simplex and uh, all the here we have um, a pure strategy where I'm always choosing rock in 100% of the cases and here there is one where I always choose scissors in 100% of the cases and here there's a strategy where I always choose paper in 100% of the cases and now I can have mixed strategies and the mixed strategies they are exactly here on this surface and uh, you can immediately see that this is a compact and bounded and also convex set here for all the mixed strategies of rock paper and scissors so uh, however I want to play uh, I will always end up with my strategy somewhere here on this on this on this uh, hyperplane okay and, um, well, as said, there can be many Nash equilibria, some better than others, uh, but it might be difficult to, to find them. Um, but what also follows from, from this, and uh, what was also uh, the, 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 uh, the idea behind the proof for the Nash equilibria, is uh, the existence of a saddle point. Um, that means if I think about the, the game as a zero-sum game uh, like here in the Minimax uh, theorem setting um, then there will be a saddle point um, um, where I have here this uh, equality from the Minimax theorem uh, achieved so this is the optimum solution and then uh, if uh, one of the players or X here is minimizing um, so he, he's coming down from the top, so this is the player X and the other one is the player Y, he's maximizing, he comes down from the bottom and uh, they both get to the same solution because here we have a saddle point and we know that in the minimax setting there must be a saddle point and exactly at the saddle point uh, we have our, our solution where, where the equality holds. Okay. But um, what does that mean for us? And now we have to loop back to optimization theory. Uh, consider now an optimization problem. Uh, so we want to find the infimum over the real numbers in several dimensions uh, subject to some equality constraint. And now here at this point we don't even require this to be uh, uh, affine. So ax minus b equals zero equality constraints. This here can even be um, nonlinear 
uh, equality constraints. Later on, we have to we have to change that, but here it's still all um, um, uh, possibly nonlinear. Okay, and uh, we use a shorthand to write this down. So here we will the bold x uh, when we describe the vector of all the uh, all the equality constraint values. Um, and uh, in essence, I have a solution space a big X that contains all the solutions for which here my equality constraints are holding. And um, I can uh, describe an indicator function. So the indicator function, uh, this guy here, uh, it will be zero when my X is in the feasible set, so in the big X and the indicator function will jump to infinity otherwise. So the, the indicator function, we saw that already in lecture three, I, th I think. So here, indicator function of x, and this here is a big x, um, and this is a case distinction, so I have zero if x is in big x, and it is infinity otherwise. And uh, now I can write down my, um, my constraint optimization problem as if it was an unconstrained optimization problem. So here this would be my constraint original version where I have my equality constraints encoded here in this set big X. But I can write the same now as an unconstrained optimization problem over all the real numbers in, in n dimensions uh, by taking this special uh, tilde f which jumps to infinity if I get outside of my uh, solution set and uh, the infimum obviously will then lie inside of, of my solution set. Okay. And um, the essential insight that we have here is that we can replace the use of this indicator function here uh, by adding an additional supremum term. Um, so here I have f of x plus my indicator function. And this here is obviously, this is f tilde of x. This is f of x plus the indicator function. And I can write the same one as f of x plus some y transposed uh, c of x and then take the supremum of y. And now what happens here? If, if y if y not equal the zero vector, then this will then the supremo will tend to infinity, because then I can choose. Uh, wait a sec. Um, no, if c if if c of x, yeah, and this here bold c is not the zero vector then the whole thing will go to infinity because here the supremum it can choose a very small or very large value in in epsilon uh, in in y uh, to let this go to infinity because the supremum wants to get as large as possible yeah? and if it if it has like a hold if there is a non-zero term somewhere here in in the c of x then the supremum can can crank that up and uh, can let it go to infinity however if c of x is the zero vector, then the entire thing here, it will go to f of x. Yeah? And therefore this is exactly the same as uh, f of x plus the indicator function. Um, okay, and in addition, we know that our f of x, now let's say our f of x is, uh, is convex. And uh, furthermore, say that the cx equals zero. Here, this guy here is a of x minus b equals zero. Because that means then essentially that uh, my problem is convex in x and it is concave in uh, y, when we now get to y. Um, um, then, or, but still here, I can write the entire thing down as, uh, the, inf as uh, the infimum or the minimization of f of x subject to uh, the constraints down here. 
I can write the same as um, a function f of x plus y transpose c of x and take the infimum of the supremum of that. So the optimization problem up here, it could be equivalently represented as this guy down here. And um, uh, let me backtrack, this still works if uh, f of x is not convex and it still works if the c of x uh, are not uh, linear equality constraints. Um, so here we are still in a, in a very, very general settings and here the, still the two uh, uh, bounded uh, red boxes, these are, these are equivalent problems. Okay. And now we can move on from that. Um, and now we introduce the, the affine equality constraints. So ax minus b equals zero. And uh, what we now see is that the minimax formulation that we saw, it looks really, really similar to the Lagrangian formulation that uh, we saw in, in lecture four. So here I have uh, this problem up here. Uh, expressed as this inf sub f of x plus something problem. And it looks exactly like the Lagrangian formulation. Um, the difference is now for the Lagrangian formulation, I try to find the point, the saddle point, where uh, the Lagrangian is exactly zero. But in the minimax formulation, it's the same. Um, I, I, um, I'm interested in, in, the, in, the, in the saddle point also of this minimax formulation. And um, um, uh, here we see this, this uh, great, great equivalence of the two approaches or of the two historical ways to get to, to, to the same formula. Okay, so now we have different motivations. Huh? It's the same equation, but for different motivations. And uh, the minimax formulation, it gives us one additional really important insight. That means if we have found the saddle point, so if we have found um, the point um, x star and lambda star, where our um, optimum lies, so if I have found this uh, saddle point, where also this uh, condition uh, he up here is fulfilled, then I have equality between the primal problem, where I have the infimum of the supremum, and the supremum of the infimum. So here I have equality between the two. If I'm at x star and lambda star. And uh, we will now exploit this and try to abuse this or uh, yeah, exploit this um, additional structure that we have found that we can just reverse here the infimum and the supremum step and uh, we will see some interesting results from that. And um, we will now see uh, we will now see what is the Lagrangian dual. So we are talking about Lagrangian duality here and now here in the dual problem I have this inner function that then only depends on the lambda because the x will be selected internally by taking the infimum. So here this is this q of lambda and I'm calling this the Lagrangian dual. And now this uh, Lagrange multiplier from um, the Lagrange term, we also call that a dual term now. Now, from the minimax inequality that we saw on the first side, uh, it follows weak duality. And that means if I take the, the dual the, um, of uh, the Lagrange term, then for all points um, 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 x and lambda, uh, the solution will be smaller than in the then the optimum can get uh, for um, uh, by solving here the infimum and supremum problem. Uh, so here this guy here this will yield us the Lagrangian term at x star and lambda star. Okay. 
and uh, the supremum um, will of the infimum, so here the dual term, it will be smaller than that, and that directly follows from the minimax equality. And the difference between the two, I'm calling that the duality gap. Uh, so here um, we have like the optimization problem, um, like this, and then the, so the, the dual. Uh, now imagine this a little bit in, in 3D, so here and then I have two solutions. I have here the uh, optimum solution and then the dual might uh, attain, might exactly get uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the settle point. But in some problems um, the, the, the minimax theorem conditions are not fulfilled and then uh, I cannot uh, get exactly to the settle point and I will end up in a solution that is, that is a little bit worse. And then there will be here this, uh, this duality gap between the two. And from this duality gap, I can describe also uh, whether it is worthwhile to invest more time in optimizing, in optimizing or if I'm already close enough. Okay. So if this duality gap is zero, then we have uh, what is called strong duality. If it's not zero, we are talking about weak duality. And um, in the case of strong duality, we know that the value of the dual function will be exactly the value of the primal problem that we try to optimize. And uh, that's easy to see because the, the second part in the Lagrange term, this guy here, it vanishes in the, vanishes in the optimum. Okay. And um, the, the minimax theorem tells us or when the conditions for the minimax theorem hold, uh, then we know that we have strong duality, then we must have strong duality. But there are other conditions that we can check to see if, uh, if we are in a situation with a strong duality. There are a couple ones, what is mostly used are the Slater's conditions. And uh, the Slater's conditions tell us that if our f is um, a convex problem, um, over, so it's also convex over um, with a primal a feasible set X, then there exists, uh, then it is strong, uh, strongly dual if there exists a solution in the interior of big X. So recall from lecture three the discussion of open and closed sets. And uh, so if I have my solution X somewhere here inside, and if I can draw an epsilon ball for some arbitrarily small epsilon and uh, this is still fully contained in my set big X, then I know I have a solution in the interior of X and then there is strong duality. We will later see an example where we don't have strong duality. So recall from the lecture three exactly that and we can now write the Slater's conditions as uh, this term here. So I have a convex problem and there exists an element in my solution set so that I can find an epsilon larger zero where the epsilon ball is fully contained in the solution set. So I have an interior point. And uh, so Slater's theorem uh, will also work when I have inequality constraints in addition to the equality constraints that we have just considered. Um, and we will see what uh, the inequality constraints mean for the dual uh, later on in the lecture. Okay, now we have seen when, um, um, when we have strong duality and now let's apply this new knowledge on a couple of example problems. And the first example problem here is um, a quadratic optimization problem. So I want to find the infimum of um, one half x transposed times x. So this is a quadratic optimization problem subject to some um, linear equality constraints or affine equality constraints, so linear with an offset. Okay, and uh, we can write this down as the, as the dual problem with a Lagrangian and here this inner Q of lambda is uh, the infimum over x for uh, our uh, quadratic term, a half x transposed x, plus here lambda transposed ax minus b. Okay, and 
Um, now we know for this Q lambda here, we can compute a closed form solution. So we know that this is a convex optimization problem. And, um, and um, so here taking this infimum here, we can think about this problem also as X transposed. And then I have here a identity matrix with a lot of ones. And then X plus lambda and so on. And uh, for this guy, we know that the identity matrix here is um, a positive definite. And uh, therefore, we know that the entire problem is convex and looks a little bit like this, like a, like a, like a, a square function, but in several dimensions. And, um, and then in addition, we have some equality constraints. And uh, for, for, for this guy here, we know that um, um, it is a, a quadratic term plus a term that is linear in X. So here we have an additional, an additional term that is linear in X. And uh, we know how to solve that in closed form uh, because we can just find here the lowest point by um, taking the gradient of um, the part that is marked red here and uh, setting the gradient to zero. And uh, so here, this is the gradient and uh, we set that to zero and we retransform it a little bit. And now we have a closed form solution. And so we have Q of lambda equals to minus A transpose lambda. Okay, so we had a problem we didn't know too much about initially, but when we write down the Lagrangian and then form the Lagrangian dual, suddenly uh, we can find a closed form solution for that part and uh, now we just remain uh, with the question of finding the supremum of, of Q of lambda. And now for the supremum part we can just plug in the results. So um, I can take um, uh, I can take the results uh, here x equals minus a transpose lambda. I plug that in here and now I simplify the resulting equation a little bit and I end up with this second term that I'm now marking here in blue. And uh, this second term here, uh, it turns out is concave. So first of all, here we have this a times a transposed. And for a times a transposed, we know that this must be symmetric. So this is helping us later a little bit when we are doing further transformations. And uh, furthermore, we know that A times A transposed is a positive definite. So if you just look at this line, we see that this uh, corresponds to some um, norm problem or some norm expression for which we know the result has to be larger than zero. So uh, we know A here to be positive definite, but we take the, the negative, uh, so minus some convex problem and the supremum of that. So we have a concave problem and we are maximizing. And for this also we can now find the closed form solution by setting the gradient to zero and uh, we end up with um, lambda star, so the optimizer, as exactly this. And um, now we have found a closed form solution uh, for which we know it must be the, the optimum. Um, furthermore, we have strong duality. So for this, we can show strong duality. And uh, together with one, so one is up here, together with one, we can plug everything back in and uh, we will get the optimum also for the primal problem, uh, which is a little bit longer, but, but, some, but some easy arithmetic uh, transformations you will, you will get the same, well, it's actually not so complicated here because we can just plug the lambda up here in this and then we will get uh, x star. Okay, so this was a first example uh, where the Lagrangian duality is, is helping us solving a problem in closed form even. Now another problem um, which is not as nice because um, 
we have a, a convex problem, which is again a quadratic optimization problem with some Q here in here positive definite. However, <clears throat> we have some, some constraints that make it non-convex because here we require that xi squared is 1 for this xi. Um, um, so this xi, it has to be either plus 1 or minus 1 so that this condition holds. And that in essence means that <coughs> I get a, a, like a cube of possible solutions. So for example, here I have um, a solution 1, 1, and here I have solution 1, minus 1. Here I have minus 1, 1, and here I have minus 1, minus 1. But then the cube gets even larger if I have additional dimensions and so on. So um, here I now have uh, like a big hypercube with uh, possible solutions in the corners. And uh, there are many discrete solutions and I have exactly 2 to the n uh, possible solutions. So this thing is growing exponentially. And um, uh, well, I, I don't want to check all the solutions because I, if I bring n up to, to 30 or 35, I no longer can, can solve this even, even on a very fast computer. Um, furthermore, the Slater conditions don't hold for this because there are no interior points. So the Slater condition asks us whether there exists an interior point of the solution um, set and there is not because it's all discrete. Um, so we only have weak duality here. So it's not as nice as the previous example. Still, we can write down the Lagrangian dual, which is what we do next. So here, this is the Lagrangian dual. Uh, it's the infimum over x over here my original function plus now the um, equality constraints um, with an additional Lagrange term. And now here I cannot express it as nicely. I have to take the sum over all the i um, for the different, for the different uh, equality constraints. So notice that I here took, uh, I wrote down a Lagrange term um, that contains some um, non-linearity in the equality constraints. Okay, <clears throat> and now let's transform this. Uh, so what we can do is we can, um, uh, because here we are, have something that is quadratic in the, in the x term, we can push that forward where it will again be quadratic in the x term. Uh, so we here have now q plus uh, um, um, a matrix that is diagonal or that contains all the lambda i on the diagonal and so on and everything else will be zero um, and uh, you can just check that here i have equality between the two um, um, because i can express this uh, this sum uh, back here i can express it as uh, x transposed times this diagonal matrix times x minus, and now it comes, um, I have here this minus one here, minus the one vector transposed uh, lambda. Okay, so here I get to this term. And um, so what happens is this q, this q lambda internally is computing the infimum of uh, this function here. Um, but what I'm interested in is the supremum over all, supremum over all the Q's. Uh, and um, I, I know, for example, that uh, if I select, uh, let's say if I select uh, lambda as zero, then I will get out uh, zero again. Because um, let's let's try this out. So if I select lambda as zero, then this part here will cancel out. And if I select uh, lambda as zero, this part here will cancel out. And then the infimum algorithm, he sees that he has a positive definite Q, and uh, he will then select x as exactly zero and will return to me zero. And because this is a convex problem, he cannot get any better than that. And therefore, Q of the vector of zero is exactly zero. Okay, 
that means if I'm optimizing, and now I'm back here at uh, looking at the supremum of, of Q, then I know the solution has to be at least zero or better. Okay. Um, but there is a risk when I'm selecting the, the lambda, because if I select lambda in a, in a bad way, then suddenly v might, so here the sum of these two, v might become no longer positive definite. And um, if v not positive definite, comma, um, then q will go to negative infinity because my infimum here can then select the x in a very clever way so and let it tend to negative infinity. And we cannot have that. We cannot have that because we know that we want q to be at least zero yeah? because we are taking again the supremum for, for, all, the, um, for all the lambdas. Okay, um, so the question now is, um, can we select lambda in a good fashion where I still have V positive definite? Yeah? So what is the best lambda with V post def? Question mark. Um, and uh, there is a, a, a good idea for selecting uh, lambda from the literature. You're not expected to know this uh, in the exam, but uh, in the literature what people do is they choose here uh, for lambda um, the minus the one vector multiplied by the smallest eigenvalue of this Q matrix. There's a good explanation for that, but not for this course. So here, this one is a scalar. This one here is a scalar. Um, and um, this is a this is the best or one. This is a good lambda for which I still know that uh, v is uh, positive definite. And therefore, with this solution, I will get a lower bound because. Um, 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 we still, even though the Slater conditions don't hold, we have weak duality. And by choosing this lambda here um, and uh, plugging that in, I will find that the uh, I will get for Q the value n times the smallest eigenvalue of Q. And uh, I know that my primal solution it cannot get below that. Yeah? So this is now a lower bound for the, for the primal solution. And uh, if I'm now running heuristic algorithms, for example, that are stepping through this uh, hypercube with all the discrete uh, possible solutions, it's very helpful to have this lower bound. Um, and uh, I can then also decide when to stop, to say when, okay, probably we are close enough to, to, to the optimum solution. So even when I don't have strong duality, um, I might exploit additional structure that is exposed to me uh, by the, the dual formulation.